So um, while I, I am putting in um, a well, uh, I'm trying to uh, tag some people, would you who are watching mind introducing yourselves? Let me know who you are, what you do, where you're watching from. It is always such a joy to see who is connecting live on the call as well as if you are watching afterwards. I love to see um, who is watching on the replay. You can let me know that you're watching on the replay by uh, doing um, hashtag replay and that is really great. If you have questions, please go ahead Ahead and ask those questions because this is I mean I'm so thrilled to be able to uh, be speaking with Mara today um, and I think yeah we are both now have settled a little bit after yes <laughs> Things have stopped falling off of my lap, so I'm in good shape. <laughs> and my kids are now with my, their dad, so I don't have to worry about them, which is a big relief. So, uh, yeah, well, I'm feeling good and I'm excited. Mara, um, would you like to just take a moment to share a little bit sure. about yourself, introduce yourself to the group? Let us know who sure. You Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It is such a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure to talk with you. Um, I have loved the interviews so far that I have had a chance to listen to. I haven't been able to attend them live, largely because of work and Passover. So um, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Mara Tesler Stein, and I am a clinical psychologist, mom of three, um, two of whom are twins born um, 10 weeks early after six and a half weeks of hospital bed rest. Um, the twins and who spent um, 10 weeks in the NICU. Um, they are now tw 23, almost 24. Um, and um, I also have a, a son who just turned 21, who was technically premature, but did come home with me. He was um, a 36 weeker. Mm -hmm. um, I um, I'm in private practice here in, in Chicago, and I'm a, a specialist in perinatal and, and postpartum trauma, um, but every, everything having to do with, with perinatal period. Um, and have, have, it's really my love and my passion. It's not all that I do clinically, um, and I really do find that, that seeing, you know, you know a range um, in my clinical practice has, has been really, I think, very good for me overall. Um, but, but really if, if, if pushed to the wall and, and asked, you know, if you could do one thing for the rest of your professional life, what would it be? It would be this work, uh, w without hesitating. Um, and, uh, so I could tell you lots of things, lots of things about, about me from, you know, my, my yoga practice to my, to my writing, to my, um, loving to loving to teach and and um, you know the the books that that I was fortunate enough to to co-write and and the research that went with that and you know just this journey has been just remarkable yeah. not not something that I, I could have even imagined when I was laying in that bed in the hospital 24 24 years ago now what's wow. today the t this the 20th of, of April mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was this would have been day five of bed rest for me. Wow, and how long were you ago. on bed rest for? 45 days, six and a half weeks. No, not, not that I was, you know. I would, have, I, I would have given anything to be there longer. Mm -hmm. I was really, really, really hoping to get to 32 weeks because in my mind, 32 weeks was when you got really boring to neonatologists, and I really wanted to be boring. I wanted my babies to be boring mm. to neonatologists. Mm. Um, and they were, they were eventually boring to neonatologists. <laughs> right. But that took a while, like. It took a, it took a while, it took a yeah. while, yeah. yeah. And I know from um, some of the other um, pieces that you have shared on Facebook that um, 
this time of um, coronavirus mm. has actually been bringing up bed rest for you. Big time. Yeah, yeah it's mm. remarkable yeah. how, how evocative it has been for me, mm. how familiar it has been, it has felt. Um, the, the sudden, for me, bed rest was sudden. I went mm. in for a regular doctor's visit, um, ultrasound, measuring, it was tw I was at 24 weeks and two days, measuring growth, mm -hmm. and then a, 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 just a quick, supposed to be a quick doctor's visit, mm -hmm. and she checked me and said, how much are you, how much are you working? Mm -hmm. And it was funny because I had been so tired and I was thinking, gosh, like I really need to, I wish I could just have a break. I wish I could rest. And lately, these days, I've been running and traveling and running and running. And, I, and I've been saying, I need to find a way to create some more space mm -hmm. to think, to write, to breathe. And I thought, then and now, again, be careful what you wish for. Mm -hmm. Because that, and th you know, 24 years ago, um, she said to me, you're um, a centimeter dilated and 50% effaced at 24 weeks. Mm -hmm. And at that time I said, oh, okay. And she said, do you have anybody you need to call? I'm going to send you up to L&D to put you on a monitor. And I said, should I plan on being here all day? Mm -hmm. <laughs> just looked at me like, Woo, hello. And there's a similar kind of feeling, right? You know, like, um, you know, maybe we all ought to stay inside for a while. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, till, till it sinks in, right? Till we get it. Yeah. Um, and, and the feeling of trying to prevent the worst from happening. Mm -hmm. And that all we can do is sit still in many cases. All we can do is not do. Yeah. Because there was nothing I could do but lay in that bed, mm -hmm. truly. Um, and the dread and the what if. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much resonance. There's so much similarity that I have been feeling around that. And the, the, um, the feeling of internal contradiction that you have to grapple with in the NICU, that distance mm -hmm. is protective. Right. Is the same, the same um, paradox that we're grappling with now. Mm -hmm. We we protect by staying away. Right. We protect by by creating space. Mm -hmm. You wash your hands. You not everybody can come into the NICU. Right. Right. You're, if you have a fever, you can't come into the NICU. Mm -hmm. If, 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 right. You're, there's, you're, you're mindful, right. You're always thinking, right. right? What could create infection? What could create danger? Yeah. yeah. And just thinking about that, I'm thinking about how much that actually goes against our sort of like, human ways of protecting yes. each other like how do we protect we protect through connection mm -hmm. how do we care for our babies we care for them through touch through connection through particularly with babies and so yeah. right now what we're doing is actually i mean like yes the logical part of our brain can think i am social distancing and this is the right mm -hmm. thing to do but the sort of physiological part of our bodies and our mm -hmm. brain says this doesn't feel right. Yeah, right. 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 It it feel there that helplessness, the rage, mm -hmm. the fear, mm -hmm. um, is partly the nervous system response and desire, um, that protective urge mm -hmm. to do something, mm -hmm. to to go to do. You know, my urge to get on a plane and go to my kids who are not here, mm. who are very far away right now.
further than they were when they were in the NICU. Mm -hmm. and, who, and who ironically enough, right now, I actually cannot get to, mm -hmm. literally. I could have an N95 mask and a full hazmat suit and I could not get to them mm -hmm. because they are in a country where unless I am a citizen of that country, I actually cannot enter right now because mm -hmm. they have protect, protective measures in place. Okay. They're safe, they're fine, they're chilling. I got a text from my son saying, I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Be boring. Be really boring. Hooray! Yes, right? That's exactly that's my what you blessing. Want for your kids, you want them to be boring. That is my blessing. <laughs> be boring and be bored. Right? Because that means nothing scary is happening. Yeah. Right. But you, as the parent, are still holding the se sense of separation and the sense yeah. of not being able to do what we are just what we do when we care for others. Yes. Which is connect physically. Yes, and, and to be together physically. and to check, to check, to see physically, to touch. Mm -hmm. to, there, there's there's, a, there's um, a nervous system to nervous system resonance mm -hmm. that we, I think we do have via video, mm -hmm. but is so much stronger in person because that sensory input is is just much more visceral in person the cueing is is just more immediate right and i'm just thinking right now of all the parents because i know across particularly the united states there's a lot of separation of, of parents from babies if there's a suspected case of um, mm. coronavirus um, there's uh, separation with NICUs. Some NICUs have closed doors to all visitors. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, at least like my feeling is like right now, although a number of people in the past have been going, like in the perinatal period, have been, went through that experience to yeah. some degree, right now we have more people going through it. Yeah. And yeah. maybe in more um, extreme or intense ways, particularly with... Um, NICUs that have closed the doors to, to visitors entirely, which means that parents can't visit at all. Um, and I'm wondering like, what, like, like how, do, how do we, like, how do we as providers help parents go through that? How do we as parents survive mm -hmm. that? Like, what, is, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Again, like this doing thing. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. When, when what we do is not do. So what, what can we turn to? Mm -hmm. I think that, I think that um, what we can do, so, so when that, that question uh, makes me think on so many levels because it's, it's such a powerful question. So, so in the immediate, mm -hmm. when talking with a family, when talking with, with parents who are in that situation, mm -hmm. um, how to help them to not, first of all, be afraid of what the, what the consequences might be, because that's what I hear parents be most afraid of, right. of, oh no, what is going to be the long-term consequence on my attachment, my baby's attachment, you know, is this going to, you know, be with my child forever, yes. for example. Yes. And what I will say um, to people is, no, it doesn't have to be. There is so much that we can do, number one, for you right now, and then for your baby and you when you're reunited. Mm. So it is critically important that families not have this belief that this is irreparable. Right. It's not. It is not irreparable. Mm. And it will start with what, how we support parents mm. in, in remembering that attachment is expressed and experienced in so many dimensions. And touch mm -hmm. and presence is 
in, is one and, and our actions in person with the baby, those include many of those dimensions, but they are not all of the dimensions. Even when, when parents in the NICU can go in and parent their baby on site in the NICU. And one piece of nomenclature that I will share with you, Justina, is um, when we talk about um, parents going into the NICU, one thing that we encourage staff to do is to change the language from visitors when, when talking about parents yeah. to talking about parents coming to the NICU to be with or to parent their baby. Mm -hmm. Others are visiting, yes. but parents are not. Yes. And that's a, that's a paradigm shift mm -hmm. and can also sometimes shift policy, maybe not today, but mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. um, and can also just sort of ha help to shift conceptually for families, what they are doing there and um, what it means to be there. Mm -hmm. um, how necessary they are mm -hmm. in the moment. But they are part of a team. And so if they can remember that they're part of a team, that can also be reassuring. Mm -hmm. For families who are fortunate enough in some ways to have already been in the NICU long enough to know the primary nurses and the neonatologists, that can be very reassuring to know the people who are taking care of their baby or babies. Right, and to and that that's their proxy. Yeah. Right, but you know, checking in, thinking about, pumping milk for if you're doing that, talking to the nurses, talking to the doctor, other preparation. These are all attachment behaviors. You're still attached. Right. Right. You're still, you're still in that bond. Yeah. We get separated from people that we love for all kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. We're still attached. Right. And it becomes part of our story. Mm. It becomes part of what we have to kind of weave together as part of that narrative mm. of, of that, that story, that, that artwork of our lives right. that we, we're all creating all the time. And, and I would say then, so that's from the individual perspective, the, for those who are working in a hospital setting or in a clinic setting, what I would say is very often what we do, what we do is always important, but how we do it is always more important. Mm -hmm. So the few minutes that you spend really eye to eye with families, reassuring, reminding them, this is your baby, these are your babies. I know that you would do anything to be at that bedside and we would do anything mm. to have you at that bedside. And the only reason that you're not is because X, Y, Z, you know, at this moment in time, this is the best information we have or whatever the, the reasons are. This is one of these situations where this is a, a rapidly changing situation mm -hmm. where, where medical systems and professionals are we can all kind of hold on to everybody is doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. A lot of fear, mm -hmm. really wanting everybody to come out of this alive as much as possible. <laughs> we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, some systems are more reactive than others. And, and that's, that's always been the case. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are still hospitals that, that kick parents out during rounds mm -hmm. and there are hospitals that don't. And, you know, during the best of times. Mm -hmm. So there are systems that are, that are, that are quicker to, to be flexible and realize like, oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. They're actually not visitors, right? They're actually the patient too. And others who are like, oh no, but, but this and that, and what about this and what about that? And, and can't quite mm 
-hmm. get, get there yet. Mm -hmm. So we know this. We know that some systems have more barriers than others. Mm -hmm. um, but how, how these, these um, barriers are navigated, how these difficulties are implemented, how the healthcare providers are talking to mm -hmm. families and, and hopefully staying connected right. can make all the difference in the world. Yeah. Because yeah. they're the link. We are the link, you are the link. Mm. And, and say what you think is obvious. Right. right? Describe. Now you can, you know, do a little FaceTime, right? We can do have so many video links and, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in the, when my babies were in the NICU and I would call early in the morning after night shift, I'd get like a, a description from one of the night nurses. It was great. Um, now you could, you know, say here, look, right. this is what's happening. Yeah. You know? And all these skills of connection that people in NICUs have already got, right? Because yes. parents are often yes. not there a hundred percent of the time. Yes. It does need to be um, right. communication about what's happened while there has been a separation. Right? All those skills right. are still That's right. important, That's right. relevant, helpful. Very much so. And I hope that they would be there anyway. You know, there are many regional centers in this country where parents live hundreds of miles away. Mm -hmm. There are many children's hospitals with, with NICU, NICUs that have babies who are transported there, mm -hmm. you know, who have, you know, complicated medical issues that can't be treated in their, in their regional, mm -hmm. regional hospital centers, in their regional NICUs that need a higher level of care. So, you know, many, many people, mm -hmm. um, many nurses and, and physicians and, and respiratory therapists will, will be nodding, saying, well, we do this all the time. Yeah. We do this all the time. Parents have to go home and, and take care of their older kids or parents have to go home and work because they need to take their, their leave when the baby comes home, mm -hmm. right. you know? And more and more, there are, there are link, link systems up actually mm -hmm. that, that allow parents so much information, but more than that, that visual and auditory connection. And so parents can hear, the babies can hear parents' voice, mm -hmm. you can leave something with your smell in the, in the NICU for the baby, ask about that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can you can wear a, 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 a camisole or t-shirt ask if you can leave that for the baby the baby will recognize that smell mm -hmm. you can you can uh, leave uh, read a story sing a lullaby mm -hmm. have that leave that um, for them to play at the right volume it can be very loud and echoey in a in an isolate um, so things like that that can make make an enormous difference you know bring clothing send clothing that you bought but i mostly like i mean what i feel is so powerful of what you just said is holding out this um truth that this is not irreparable it is not it and is not at all this does not mean that your attachment is just gone forever no. and the baby will <laughs> not feel attached right it's not at all um, right it is not at I'm all irreparable saying, that in the kind of core of ourselves as we support parents, I think is incredibly yes. powerful. Yeah. Right? If we can yes. hold that for them, um, yes. it helps to, uh, to really drop the anxiety level or the concern or the fear level around that for the parents who are going through these things. Definitely. And I do think that it would be a helpful exercise mm. for each one of us to look inside and notice mm. what elements of the current state of, of the birthing environment is most activating. Right. Right. What, what is most enraging? What mm. is most terrifying? What is most, um, what evokes the most grief? Yeah. To notice each of those things um what leaves you strangely numb if that's happening just to be aware for yourself where your hot spots might be we all have them um where you might be protecting yourself by distancing or disconnecting which is is a common and often very helpful mm -hmm. way to protect yourself 
the thing to know is that we need to uh, not disconnect so much that we lose touch and attunement with our clients around something that they may be really struggling with. Right. So, you know, stay tuned into that. Um, but there is so much reconnecting and repairing that we can do when reunited with that baby. Um, that, you know, the baby's nervous system is so young and developing mm-hmm. that it's quite receptive to that evolving narrative. Mm. Right. Yeah. And that doesn't mean, on the other hand, that we don't carry these experiences with us, right? Into right. the right story. So it's like, yes, so right. there is both repair possible and, you know, the, whatever the experience is around, um, uh, you know, if you have a baby in the NICU, uh, if you've been on bed rest, if you've had a birth trauma, uh, if you have your own trauma that might be coming into the current experience, right? Like all yeah. of these things, right? Like right. We, we do carry these experiences with us um and so uh when people are noticing when they're feeling particularly uh activated by something it is an opportunity to sort of take a little um i don't know take it's like a chance to to have a look at our story a little bit it is it absolutely is i think that's right One thing that I would say about um, carrying this experience with us is that we also need to be sure to not completely merge ourselves with the baby or babies Mm -hmm. because the baby's experience, especially, for example, in the NICU, is going to also include whatever is medically going on, mm-hmm. regardless of whether we're there or not. Although our, our presence there is, of course, better if we, if we can be there. Once we can be there and once a baby is hopefully discharged, the smoothing out and the... Um, kind of clearing whatever traumatic knots Mm -hmm. may be there from those experiences can happen then for that baby right away, actually. Mm -hmm. So that that baby actually doesn't have to carry that forever Mm -hmm. as a, as an alive, like a live wire. Mm -hmm. It, it, it is part of their story, but it doesn't have to be an intrusive part of their story. And similarly for us, so for us, we are, because we are cognitively in a whole different place, we're more active meaning makers. You know, neonates are are all experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's all about that visceral, that visceral sense and that visceral experience. And so we, we, we can clear that and work on, you know, the, that, that solid sense of safety and those sort of core affective circuits that, that neonates that we're all born with. Mm. Um, and that, you know, the, the safety systems in the neurobiology, um, which we can, we can work with very directly that are completely nonverbal, don't need to be talked about, don't need to be thought about. Um, and we can work on them similarly with adults, and with kids as well. We are we complicate things with words and meaning and all kinds of other stuff. Thank you. you know, this means this about me. It means I'm a failure. It means I'm a terrible person. It means I'm a failure as a mother. It means terrible, you know, it's ruined. I don't know. These are things I said to myself on bed rest. So I don't know. <laughs> so 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 we and of course that 
it gets pulled from all those old fuel tanks from others from old old things mm -hmm. that we've all experienced growing up and and that's just how it always is mm -hmm. so we we can it can be absolutely an opportunity nothing like having kids to give you the opportunity <laughs> to work on your old stuff it's yeah. remarkable it's remarkable they bring us all kinds of opportunities mm -hmm. of, of work. <sighs> Yeah. I know that you um, have this um, metaphor that you use of weaving a tapestry. Yes. And yeah. I think that this is such a powerful metaphor. And I wonder whether you could just take some time to sort of sure. describe what's going on with this and, and maybe how it relates to what is currently happening, maybe for us or for the parents that we're supporting, mm -hmm. where maybe that knot that we thought we had unraveled and rewoven suddenly doesn't yeah. feel like it's been fully integrated into the pattern. Yes. Um. Yes. Yes. So this metaphor um, emerged um, back when um, I was, you know, in early days um, in, on the preemie journey um, in conversation with other parents of, of, of preemie babies. And, you know, so many times we wish we could just cut out those really difficult experiences. Did this just have, did this have to happen this way? Why do I have to feel this? Why did I have to see this or know this, experience this? And so what I think about is, is like this. If you think about life experience and, and, relationships and all these dimensions of our lives if you think about it as as a, as a tapestry that we're always always weaving mm -hmm. and and by living we are by definition weaving and we're born with many of the threads that we weave with we're given many of those threads after we're born um, we choose many of those threads were given opportunity to choose them and then over time sometimes threads are introduced that we would not have chosen right, right? so we're weaving and we're weaving and you know there's some threads that we're, we're comfortable with and we're familiar with some may not be our favorite but at least we're we're comfortable we're, we know them mm -hmm. you know this may not be my favorite quality but i know it well i know how to work with it you know i know how to deal with it um I like, I like the satin, I like the silk, I like the cotton. Burlap I could do without, but all right, I can, I can deal with it. And then somebody throws me some barbed wire. And then there's like some razor wire in there and that's ripping up everything. And, but you have to weave. And you have to weave. And what am I supposed to, who weaves with barbed wire? Mm -hmm. what, the, what the heck? And, and barbed wire catches on everything. Right. I actually weaved with barbed wire. Mm -hmm. At my workshop in Dallas, I have got some, and we did a weaving. It snags on things like across the room. I don't know how it does it. It's, it's remarkable. Like you think, how does this issue have anything to do? And somehow I got a piece of that caught in the barbed wire. So I'm working with this stuff. I don't want it. It's driving me crazy. All I want to do is get away from it. Right. It hurts. It hurts. It's messing everything else up. It's making a giant knot. Mm. It's cutting. It's ruining everything is what it feels like. Mm. And very often what happens is you actually end up with a knot. You end up with a big snarl in the fabric. Sometimes when this happens to people over and over again, you end up with lots of knots in the fabric. But of course, life continues, right? Continue, continue, to continue. Still weaving, still weaving, and you still have all those old threads. And sometimes you still have the barbed wire, but maybe you can, maybe it's just all cut in the knot. Still got like maybe a trailing end. And then every once in a while, it shows up again, you pull on it and that whole knot goes, mm -hmm. pulls on it, pulls on it, pulls on it. So that knot, that's trauma. That's trauma node right there. It's stuck. It's not woven. It's snarled up. Yeah, and you can't see, like, you can't see what's in it even. It's all tangled you up. You can't see what's in it. 
it's it's yeah. a, it's it, it's such a giant snarl of things you don't see what's in it and it's interesting that you say that because when we go in to address it mm. what happens is our our treatment that is neurobiological that is what we call bottom up mm. that isn't thinking about or trying to manage, but rather comes from the bottom up, from the, the, um, lim the limbic system, from the emotional brain, from the reptilian brain up, works to actually untangle that knot. And all this stuff comes out and people will say, I don't know where that came from. I don't know where that came from <laughs> because you don't know what's in the knot. And I will say, yeah, because we don't know what's in the knot. Just notice it. And go with that. And that's what happens. Like the stuff comes out. And the other metaphor I give, which is completely not tapestry like, but shows my history with Sesame Street, mm -hmm. is it's like Oscar the Grouch, you know, when every once in a while Oscar the Grouch wants to clean out his clean out his garbage his garbage can, you know, and so he like goes in there and you see like out comes a banana peel, out comes a rubber chicken, out comes, right? It's like that. It's like whoop, whoop, I didn't know this was in here. Whoop, I didn't know that was in here. And that's what it's, that's what it's like, right? All this stuff comes out. And so things are unplugging. So that's, that's what it's like when you're processing trauma. And, and then what happens is, sorry for all the wiggling. I'm trying to not get unplugged here. So, um, so then what happens is all that stuff, that was all snarled up is now available to the weaver. Mm. And the weaver knows how to weave. And the weaver now has some distance because the weaver's not overwhelmed. And the weaver weaves it back in. Mm -hmm. The weaver can look and say, oh, that's interesting. I didn't notice that before. Oh. Oh. I did that? Oh, I had forgotten I did that. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Oh, that's right. And there's all this new understanding and knowing and realizing that happens that you cannot happen, that you cannot have and can't experience when the knot is still tangled because you're not able to look at it. You are only in it when you're, when you're touching it. You, you actually fall into the knot mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's a re-experiencing. It's not a uh, remembering, it's not true memory. Mm -hmm. Trauma memory is actually not, it's, it's a misnomer to call it memory. Mm -hmm. It's not actually memory. It hasn't been transferred into long-term memory yet that's part of the problem right and so it can't be thought about yet exactly it only gets re-experienced in one form or another which is why it feels just like it's just spinning in the same place and it doesn't move right just over and over again versions of the same thing so you get flashbacks or nightmares or sensory re-experiencing or reenactment, mm -hmm. recapitulation of the same thing, seeking out the same sorts of situations, unconsciously trying to master them. There's all these different ways in which this gets replayed because um, it hasn't been digested, rewoven, untangled and rewoven. And it's like the, as you said earlier, we are, um, complicated beings and we have thoughts and beliefs about things so mm -hmm. um, our thoughts and beliefs I'm a terrible mother I failed um, kind of get body failed my baby I failed my baby terrible mm -hmm. not and in the untangling of it we can begin to see how some of those things might not actually be the truth Exactly. And how and begin to make other kinds of meaning as we weave. That's exactly what happens. 
So now we can exactly. say, oh, I did the best that I could, which is completely That's different. Exactly. Than I failed. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. And in fact, when, when I do EMDR therapy, for example, our standard protocol will ask the, the client when they're looking at the memory, um, the words that go best with that incident that express their negative belief about themselves now, as they sit here now, not back then, but now remembering it. And so for example, it might be, I'm a terrible mother, right? right? I'm a terrible person. Um, and what do you wish you could believe right now? Mm. That doesn't feel true right now. Might be I did the best I could. Yeah. Doesn't feel true right now. Right. But by the end of the processing, when that memory, when that experience has actually become memory, mm. you go back again and say, and so how true now does that? When you go back now to, I did the best I could, suddenly, instead of it feeling not at all true, very often, almost always, it feels almost completely true. Just by clearing the trauma, letting that, what we're doing is we're helping the, the part of the nervous system, the part of the self that does know how to weave, so to speak. We call that the adaptive information processing system, um, which sounds so mechanical. And, and right. I have to tell you, it's so mechanical. No, you, it sounds so mechanical. And the re I'll tell you, let me just give you, let me just segue for a second and just tell you the reason for this, the reason EMDR often sounds so mechanical, I will tell you, is that Francine Shapiro, who originated it, one of the things that, one of the gifts actually that she gave us and left us with is she was very, very encouraging of research into EMDR therapy because she really wanted to be sure that what she was, ex what she had observed and what she was seeing was real. Mm -hmm. She didn't want it to be quackery. She wanted it to be real. So what she really did was she really worked to operationalize what the process was so that it could be replicated. She didn't trademark anything. She didn't like, she didn't do any of that. She wanted, and, and, and to this day, worldwide, this, this procedure, this, this approach is researched very rigorously. And so because of that, there is this language that is attached to it that has this very um, um, mechanical scientific flavor to it. Mm -hmm. And for, because it allows people around the world to speak the same language and know, we all know what we're talking about. That said, I will tell you as a therapist, as an EMDR therapist, and, and anybody here who has trained with me, who has seen, and, 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 and please chime in if you have, um, it is such a relational therapy. It is such an, uh, an artistic, there's an art to it. There really is. It is so fluid. Mm -hmm. It is so, um, you, you cannot do it, I don't think consistently, effectively, if, you can, if you're not present in the process, mm. um, you have to be attuned, you have to be related, you have to be in there. You're, you're dancing with the client, you're, you're in there. It's amazing, it's an amazing, amazing process. So for me, I find the language, it's just the word we use to describe this really cool thing that we as therapists all know happens. Yeah. It's like this part of the self that's like, I know that. I just know it for everybody else. I don't know it for myself. Well, that's your, inform your adaptive information processing system. That's what EMDR <laughs> calls it. But okay, so call it something else, whatever. Right. It's okay. Like we all know what that is. That's mm -hmm. the, the, the healthy, adaptive, um, the, the flexible, compassionate mm -hmm. parts of us. Mm -hmm they haven't had access to the stuck, snarled up trauma. Mm -hmm. We just have a standardized name for it. That's all. Right. right? So I, I, I just, I have heard so much as a trainer and, you know, in talking to people about, you know, kind of the, the, the reputation or the, 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 the ideas about the therapy. And, and, and at first I was like, so, so surprised. Like, oh, really? Like that is not, 
really? You think that? That's not my experience. That's not how I do EMDR, really. Where you get? I, I really didn't know where it was coming from, and and I started to understand a little bit about why and and where. And I just I just want to say, um, please don't think that this approach is mechanistic, robotic, manualized, rigid. It is not. Right, and I think that that's really important because as for people who have maybe heard of EMDR but are not trained. Yeah either provide it or have yeah. experienced it before yeah. the language is actually quite a barrier to even like understanding what it is what we're talking about how yeah. it might work like sure. whether like you should ever recommend it to a client of yours right? it's hard to explain also i think um it also i tell people so i use a lot of humor because i can't help it and i just sort of hope people get my humor <laughs> like that's kind of a but I just tell people, yeah, it sounds like voodoo. It sounds absolutely ridiculous. And I also tell people that I sound like an infomercial when I talk about it. And there's very few things that make me sound like an infomercial, but EMDR is one of them. And it's not because I'm brainwashed, but it's because I've been using it for 17 years. Um, and I've just experienced. Um, and, and so that brings me the enthusiasm. Um, and that said, I've also gone ahead and gotten training in a whole bunch of, of other models and and um, and methods and, and theoretical uh, sort of uh, frameworks mm. um, that I have felt that I needed, you know, like couples treatment, um, for example, uh, yoga informed treatment, hypnotherapy, mm. um, trained in brain spotting as well. Um, so all of all of that, all of that sort of stuff, because. You know, I think it's all, EMDR plays well with others, by the way, also. Very integrative. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have 10 minutes left, and I'm wondering whether there are any questions. I've been trying to keep um, an eye on the um, on the comments, but I haven't okay. seen questions yet. Um, so okay. if you do have a question for Mara, then please go ahead and write that in. And while you are writing that in, I know there's a delay on Facebook, uh, I'm gonna ask another question. Okay, great. <laughs> Which is, um, we're talking, we've been talking about this metaphor of weaving the kind of fabric of our life and we have to keep weaving as we live. That's just how it is. How Sometimes it is. we get these snarls in the fabric and we can do some work to unravel and then reweave the the parts of our story that need to be rewoven. Um, what happens when we think that we've unwoven? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And then along comes COVID nineteen. Oh yes. Oh yes. <laughs> or something else. I mean, it doesn't have to be COVID nineteen, yes. but yes. I like right, right, use right. it as an example. Yeah. Along comes COVID nineteen. Yes. And suddenly that experience of being on bed rest comes up again and you think, I worked on this I already. I did this. I did this. I right. did this already. I, so I, there's I, a I related work. metaphor. So you might have noticed, I kind of like metaphors. So the <laughs> other metaphor that I think we could probably weave into this other one, but let me just get, let me, let me tell you this one. So we know development is not a straight line right? And we revisit themes over and over again in our development mm -hmm. as we should. So sometimes when something is evoked in, an, in a present day situation in a very strong, powerful way, it means there is a fuel tank back there that we didn't get to. Now, that could mean that work we did prior that we thought addressed the fuel tank didn't completely drain it for one reason or another okay that happens it could be that one of the reasons it didn't drain it is that there was a component to the fuel tank that wasn't accessible yet because when we are when we address something developmental mm -hmm. sometimes we have we don't know a thing until it is presented to us so there's there, the, the, the issue that we're grappling with in the present day may not have been something relevant, available, accessible five years ago or 10 years ago. 
or it may need to be processed on a different level from a different vantage point now. And so a non-trauma related, I say non-trauma, but I'm going to talk about toddlers and teenagers. So sort of, sort of non-trauma related um, developmental example of this, um, just to give you an idea of what I mean by revisiting is that we do, we humans do a process of separation and individuation over and over again in development. It doesn't mean we have failed to do it mm. the last time. So two-year-olds, two and three-year-olds do this, mine, I do it, I do it myself, no, yeah, the whole thing that they do, right? Yeah. Like, and you just want to be like, oh, uh, fine, right? And the whole line, like, you know, and they're furious that you've brought them inside, then you're, they're furious you brought them outside, and then I give them the phone number for Amnesty International and say, just call, <laughs> just call, just call, just call. Just fucking remove me. Um, and then you get over it, right? And you think, oh, it's heaven, right? And then they become adolescents. Mm. And then they do it again, mm. right? Not because you didn't traverse it well with them before, but because they do it again, right? Right. And then they do it kind of again in young adulthood or baby adulthood, as I call it, mm -hmm. right? And then we do it in different ways and in, into, into our older adulthood and in, in, in inverse with our own parents there's these different ways of of re-engaging and reconnecting and then separating again as we lose family members and so this you know distance proximity separation connection navigating all of that we do this over and over again negotiating that from different vantage points at different parts of development that's normal mm -hmm. So it is understandable that there will be times and there will be issues that will come up in, in life, trauma-related, loss-related, um, meaningful, thematically meaningful events, and birth-related events, perinatal, parenting, attachment, family events are the most important. Of course they are. They are likely to evoke so much meaning and so we will revisit and when you revisit something on level two and level three it's going to you're going to tap on some of those earlier levels because we're reweaving so we're not just weaving a tapestry we're weaving like a multi-level multi-dimensional right. kind of artwork here yeah it's not a straight line. It's not like no, it's not. weaving across like this. We're also not a two-dimensional down yeah. and through, and we're reaching yeah. out here for that thread that we thought was finished, but actually right. we're gonna like weave it's, that over here. Yeah, and there's like a, an unfinished piece here that can't be finished till we get over here. Mm -hmm. So, so be compassionate. Be mm -hmm. compassionate to yourselves to each other, around, something that gets evoked, you know, it's hard to be sometimes compassionate when you're, when you're so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it is an opportunity. I know it sounds so cliche, but it really can be an opportunity. Um, I, I, you know, when I, when this piece that I wrote at the beginning of the, of this um, quarantine, I really wanted to write a blog post. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, this thing that was insisting it was going to be written in second person and was was all like literary sounding and I was like in my head talking to it saying you are a blog post stop it behave and it was making me uncomfortable <laughs> yeah behave right <laughs> hey I need you to be a blog post right, do and what it was I'm, like, be. <laughs> I'm not going to be a blog and I kept trying to change yeah. forget it just mm. forget about it forget just let it just, mm. had to be what it was going to be. I had to weave what it was going to be. Yeah. It's so powerful because, you know, and I think about this in terms of a metaphor that I often use, which is that, um, you know, when we think about trauma, trauma is, is being stuck. So we're stuck in the, in the moment that the trauma is when, yeah often people think about healing as like, I want to get over here, all the way over here to this place that is like healed and I'm finished and I'm done with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I like to think about healing as like walking the journey. And so oh, yes. in the walking of the journey, right, we are doing healing and healing yes, is not something 
that that sort of necessarily we get to a point and we say, okay, we're done. We're finished with all of oh, this. No. I never oh, have no. to retouch that stuff ever again. I never have to think about oh, it no. again. I never going to be affected by it again. I'm done. Right. Instead, it's the movement. It's in the yes. it's in the actual walking of the journey that that is healing. That is the the doing of healing. Yes. And and as we walk that journey, there are times when the journey becomes hard. And that's just life. Life is like that. We we walk the journey and, and then there's a river that we have to cross and we have to wade through it. And exactly. then there's a mountain that we have to climb and a forest we have to go through. And sometimes it's scary and sometimes we don't know what's coming next. Sometimes it's beautiful. We get to the top of the mountain and there's this glorious vista, right? And as we walk the journey, we're not stuck, right? And right. so... Um, so yes, these things can be hard, right? When, and sometimes it, we kind of turn a corner and we find ourselves kind of back where, where we were at the beginning and we're like, hang on a second. Yeah. This looks kind of familiar. And I thought that mm -hmm. I'd already walked through this forest. Mm -hmm. But now when we're walking through the forest again, we're like, oh, I'm walking through it from a different location. And maybe this path- And I know how to do this. I know, I know how to do this. this. And I know that the forest isn't forever. I know that, that there's another yes. side to this forest. Yes. Right. Yes. And so there's a different kind, is it that you have a different experience? Not the same forest. You never, you know, they say you never step right. in the same river twice. Yeah. Right. And so I love this, the metaphor of the, 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 the weaving, because I feel, and, and also of these different levels where we return to things, because it's like in this w process of doing the weaving, this is the process of of healing this is yeah. it's in that it's and yes. and it's not you know we're never going to finish the tapestry no right the ta we don't no. get to the end because no living is weaving living, living is, is weaving. Journeying. yes living is journeying and i will often tell my clients i mean as you're describing this this metaphor that you use i'm i'm thinking, I often will say that to, to clients, I'm like the, the cartographer. I know how maps work. I know how landscape works. Yeah. You know, I can sort of say to you, well, here, you know, a river's coming up here. Let's prepare for how to ford the river. Let's, you know, we know if this, have we been in this kind of, of landscape before, you know, this, this journeying is yes if we're and and you know people sometimes pause and rest and we can rest and we can gather supplies and we can take a moment and get your you know get our bearings and say all right yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna gonna take a breath i'm gonna get a good night's sleep and then i'm gonna right. forge on i'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna for a while and enjoy the view enjoy the view i'm gonna say this is beautiful i don't have to rush to get to some destination yeah. where I have to then go to the next place because right. living is journeying. Yeah. Or I'm afraid to step over this river. So maybe I'm going to build a bridge first. Right. Mm, yes. Right. Or I, you know, as I, as I, and as I go through this journey, I get, you know, like I get more tools in my toolbox. I get more, I have, I carry a pack with me, a helpful pack, not a weighted yeah. down one, but one that's like, yes, I, yes, exactly. I, Take the rocks out of the pack and the put in your magical objects. And then my magical objects, exactly. Yes. And, and so, you know, you may, you may end up with a fellowship traveling with you. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you may, you may have fellow travelers. Yeah. And you don't have to do it alone. Right. Right. And so there are times like this when, Yes, like, I mean, I felt it, um, things that have been, you know, coming up for me. And I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't want to see you again. <laughs> like, I put you away a long time ago. <laughs> like, I don't, and, I, and, then, and then I'm like, okay, like, I have to, like, there is a part of me that also remembers, for me anyway, this metaphor. And, and I'm like, okay, like. That doesn't mean that I haven't done my work and it doesn't mean that I didn't right. unravel that knot at the time. And maybe there is more work to be done, but I couldn't have completely unraveled it because as you say, I need to be over here from a different yes. point of view to be able yes. to access the knot. I, I was on the wrong side of the tapestry. 
Exactly. Like, and very often until you did that work, mm -hmm. you couldn't have gotten to this work. Right. And that's, that's fine. You know, we do very often a piece and we rest. Mm. This isn't a race. Right. Right. It's beautiful. Well, thank you. We are um, at time. And were there were there questions? Or are people I no questions? No questions. We have um, a couple of comments. Leslie Ann says, "I love the response about this. I love the response about the scripted response slash criticism to EMDR. I think of it like handwriting. There is a mm. model of cursive writing, but we all mm. have our own personal handwriting. Oh, and I love that the power to write our own stories. Oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. And we do. We have the power to write our own stories. We do. We do." Great. And sometimes we need help. And that's why we get yes. companions, people on the journey with us. And you know, in my experience, I think at some point in time, we almost always will need companionship, mm -hmm. if not help. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. We're designed, we're built to be in relation, in relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. And so we're really not designed. We're not meant to do any of this alone. Right. right. And so doing it alone is the, is hard, is harder. Mm -hmm. And is, you know, it makes it, it's like, you know, you're doing it with, you know, your hands tied behind your back. Right. Like uh, just, and sometimes there isn't an option. Mm -hmm. um, but when there is an option to, to have community, to have, to have connection, um, it, it, it really is, is so much more of an organic way of being, um, and it, and it facilitates the healing. Right. And even in this moment in time, when we are all in our houses, and Zoom can feel very draining and hard. Mm -hmm. It is, um, it is still, uh, there are still ways to, to find those connecting pieces with people. That's, yes. I guess yes. that's, you know, yeah. you know, while also acknowledging that it's, you know, we're all, you know, like we miss people. We, we miss being in the physical presence of people and that's normal. Yeah, it is. It is normal to be missing being in the physical presence of the people that we love and care for. Absolutely, that is. Yeah, and and it's normal to to be um, uneasy with the uncertainties mm -hmm. and the inability to plan. Yeah, uh, the not knowing mm -hmm. is difficult. You know, again, similar kinds of things that come up with these perinatal crises. Right. You know, when, when will they come home? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. When can we? I don't know. Yeah. I was thinking about the, what you were saying at the beginning of our conversation around bed rest and how at first you're like, okay, well, I'll be in for a day and then maybe I'll be in for a little while and then slow and and then you there's a point at which you're like oh no this is oh yeah this is how it's going to be for a while and i think that a lot of us particularly in my community of friends um this week in particular has been that week of realization mm -hmm. a week of oh this isn't snapping back in two weeks <laughs> just to yeah, be yeah. And yeah. even as restrictions get eased, whenever they do get eased, it's not going to look normal for a while. And, yeah. Yeah. And so this week in particular, I think, has been hard for people because mm. there's a realization, just like you had at some point, of like, oh, mm. we're not just going to be through this. Like, it's yeah. going to be. Forget short. about it. Oh, this was a blip. Blip. This, this is really impactful. Yeah. yeah. You know, it reminds me actually, 
you know, very often neonatologists will say that the fame, there's a famous line, I call it, you know, they, they will say things like, go home, take your baby home and treat them like a normal baby. I could unpack that for the next hour, but I won't. <laughs> but the piece that I will, I will say about that is the, one of the things that it implies is you'll just forget about all of this. That's one of many problems with that, with that statement. If, what on earth makes you think that I'm going to walk out that door and somehow magically be able to treat this baby who was just in intensive care like that baby who was born 48 hours ago full term, mm. healthy without complications? How, how? Is that possible? Baby weighs significantly less. Baby, my babies were on oxygen when they came home. <laughs> Actually, happens to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many things. I mean, all of the anxiety, all of the trauma, all of the uncertainty, all of the differences, all of the, you know, babies who are not even perhaps mm -hmm. at term dates yet. Right. Right. Could be a baby at term who was, you know, had had an anomaly or needed surgeries or something. We don't forget, right? And similarly here, this is impactful. Mm. We have n almost nobody alive has experienced anything like this. I think the closest analogy that I can think of was people who were alive before a polio vaccine mm. and who, when there were outbreaks, had to stay in like wouldn't send their kids to the swimming pool, you know, couldn't go to camp, couldn't. And I don't even think it was this restrictive as far as I know, but that there was the same fear of infection and, and you know, devastation if you got sick. Um, but that was a long time ago. Yeah. And then before that would have been a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. So how could this not be impactful? Right. You're going to forget this. And not just because of, you know, lost time, lost income, lost connections, lost events, canceled things or anything like that. Not just because of that. Experience is impactful. Right. right. Let it be impactful. It's meaningful. And it changes okay, who we are. I mean, yes. I'm thinking about what you said around like, treat your baby as if it's a normal baby. And what that also implies is be a normal parent. Yeah. There, yeah. There's a, be a parent who hasn't had this experience. Right. And right. First, right. And right, let's even take away the world normal, which needs to be dismissed altogether. But yes, like, like act like this hasn't happened to any of you. Right. And, and it takes away the, the, the reality that this is meaningful. The fact that this has happened is meaningful. Mm. meaningful doesn't have to mean bad there have been hard things mm -hmm. painful things scary things difficult things you know would I would I do anything even today to make it that my children were not premature that they would have had all of the developmental time in utero that that they were you know entitled to you bet mm -hmm. you bet I would would I, if, would I still grieve giving up the development that I gained because I had the experience of the bed rest and the <laughs> prematurity and the NICU and all the years since then? I would grieve the loss of that for me. I wish I could give them back those 10 weeks mm -hmm. and the six weeks and all of the steroid exposure and stuff, my stress that they were exposed to and not lose what I gained mm -hmm. over the last... 24 years right. because what I gained I can't even measure mm. there's just no possible way to quantify that mm. what I've learned how I've grown and changed there's just no way people I've met relationships there's just no right priceless mm. 
So it's meaningful. Let it be meaningful. Look for the meaning. And it can be, and it's both it's painful and it's difficult and it's kick and scream and yell. Mm. And find the meaning. Right. Because the you meaning know, maybe not is. in the same moment. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately. But like the thing about this tapestry that you've been describing is that it doesn't have to be woven in the moment. We can exactly. reach back to that thread and see yeah. how we can begin to make sense out of it and pull it into that's right what we're doing now in a way that is helpful to us that gives us strength and power like there are, it doesn't have to necessarily be right now exactly and it doesn't mean it's it's snarled in a knot either no there can be a thread there that's woven in and then you look and you say i could use that one more mm -hmm. I, I didn't like that one at first but i'm seeing where where it it complements some of the other threads I've got going here. That's a surprise. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe there was one hanging that you never knew really what to do with. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So many possibilities. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'm so phenomenally grateful for this conversation. For Such you. a pleasure. <laughs> like, Such a pleasure to talk to you. Community and sharing with um, all the amazing people here who do such phenomenal work. Such a great community you've built here. Um, it's so exciting to to hear you speak and to, yeah, connect with you and learn yeah. from you, hear your wisdom. Um, honestly, yeah. I'm so grateful. Uh, if you do have a comment or a question, we can get to those. Um, uh, mm -hmm. We can write responses. So. Please, uh, if you're watching on the replay, then go ahead and mm -hmm. um, share your thoughts if, if you want. We're, we're really um, open to, to responding uh, to you that way. And take care, and I will see you um, soon. Oh, I see that my broadcast got interrupted. I hope that that hasn't been going on for too long. But if it has, it we will. It says yeah, I, my... my um, it says on my phone the broadcast got interrupted, but hopefully not not too long ago. Um, okay. Interrupted, and if if it was, I can always still post. recording. I'm still so recording, so if we need to post the full video, then we can do that. I will go back and check. Um, it looks like maybe just the last few minutes got cut off. Okay. Oh. We'll post the full video anyway, right? I can, yeah, I'll post the full video, so that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing on, on live on Facebook okay. and say goodbye to everyone on okay. Facebook. Bye, everybody. Thank you. And say thank you. And I will stop the live stream now.